Hello everybody, so uh, in this video I want to talk a little bit about some of the keys to reading the kata properly. Uh, this is a topic we have discussed before in the app, but I've been getting a lot of feedback from you on it as well. So I thought I'd kind of cover how I go about it briefly. Um, so one of the common things that happens at seminars, you know, in the breaks, people come over and talk to me about various katas that they do and little variations that they've got, which I always really enjoy those discussions. Uh, sometimes people will show me a kata that I don't know and, and you know this movement's confusing me what can you tell me about it you know and sometimes the answer is I don't know you know there's and that's I always tell my own students yeah I don't know is always a perfectly acceptable answer it's better that than trying to bluff it right so if I look at something and I go I don't know what that is uh, then I'll say I don't know what that is but a lot of the time 90% of the time uh, applying what I call my core process I can see what's going on. Now, obviously, I'm well practiced at this. You know, it's, it's been my full time job for decades, right? So I, I can read kata pretty well. Um, and there's lots of things that can give you an insight into what the kata is uh, showing. So if you know a little bit about the history of the kata, where it came from, what the influences were, who created it, uh, what name the kata has, can sometimes give insights as well to the kind of methods in there as well. So there's these other things. But the core things that I always go to are what I call the big three. Uh, so I want to break down each one of those three uh, in turn for you. So what are the big three? So I always say it's uh, angle, stance and arm position in that order. So in that order is important, right? So the first thing we've always got to look at is angle. So the angle at which the movement is performed in the kata, that tells you the angle you have taken and you are attacking the enemy from. So as soon as you've got that worked out, you know the relative positions of, of yourself, the person performing the kata, or the techniques within the kata, and the other person. So that, that's a big thing to start with. So you need that in place before you look at anything else. So as we've talked about previously, this is well documented in the old texts. Mabuni wrote a big article about it, uh, Taguchi talks about it, he says that Maggi told him this, uh, um, and Motobu mentions it in passing as well, so a common misunderstanding is that the angle in the kata is the angle the enemy is attacking you from. Now this error seems to have been introduced fairly on, because Mabuni talks about that in his, his uh, article on angles, where he says, you know, uh, the purpose of angles in kata is not well understood, and this has led to some people saying things like, this kata moves in eight directions and is therefore for fighting uh, uh, eight people, or some other such nonsense. So this common thing we see nowadays with one guy standing in the middle with everyone around him on the compass points attacking in turn, in the 1930s, you know, so 90 years ago, uh, Mabuni said, nonsense. You know, he went on to say that such interpretations were highly unreasonable. And he makes a logical argument about, you know, there's two ways you can look at it. One is the enemy's attacking from that angle, or the second one is you're shifting to that angle. And quite rightly, he says, you know, shifting to that angle makes a lot more sense because then you can apply the cutter in the chaos of combat. If you're reliant on the opponent attacking from a very specific angle, you have a problem, right? Because what are the chances of that? It's a joke I always say at seminars. If you want to beat up a traditional karateka, attack him from 60 degrees, right? He's used to 90 degrees. He's used to 45 degrees. 60 degrees will be like punching him from another dimension, right? They're just not used to it. So and it's very, a lot simpler than people think as well. So if the captain is going straight forwards, then the opponent is in front of you. If the captain is going at 45, then you have moved to a 45 degree angle relative to the opponent. Um, it, you, you have the bits where the kata turns at the end, right? Well, that's simply because, you know, dojos are only so big. So you can ignore that kind of jackknife that a lot of them have. Just coming back the other way. Uh, but if you're in the middle of a sequence and there's a sudden turn, that can mean the turn is part of the technique, but it can also mean you are behind the opponent when you do this technique. If the kata goes sideways, then it means you are sideways onto the opponent when you do this technique. You move to that angle. Now, the kata can't tell you how to move there because there's so many variables, right? So how are you moving relative to each other to start with? Is the opponent coming towards you, away from you, and they're moving clockwise, anti-clockwise? You, you cannot map out the footwork to get to that angle because there's so many unknown variables. So the kata doesn't even attempt to do that. It goes, be at this angle to do this technique. So that, that one is absolutely massive. Again, a lot of you have been to my seminars, you'll know when I talk, start talking about angles, I always tell people, if you learn nothing else today, remember this, because it is the most important thing I'm going to say today. 
So when we're looking at decoding kata, you know, the big three, um, the first thing you want to look at is the angle. If the movement's at 90 degrees, then you have shifted. So you're 90 degrees relative to the opponent. 45 degrees, you've shifted 45 degrees straight on behind as we've discussed. So that, that's how the kata works. Combatively, there's two principles you need to be aware of for this. The first one is keep the enemy in front of you, but do not be in front of the enemy. So if you imagine like a line coming out the front of your body, you know, my eyes are in the front of my head, that's where my, my, my joints move most efficiently. If the opponent's in front of me, I can hit them most effectively, right? And likewise for them. So I want to give myself an advantage by making sure they're on that line, but I'm not on their line. So that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we move towards what we know and away from what we don't know. So if my, I've made contact with the opponent's um, left arm, then I want to move to that side. So I'm moving away from the uncontrolled arm or the one I'm unaware of. So they're the two combative rules. Keep the enemy in front of you, but do not be in front of the enemy. Move towards what you know and away from what you don't know. And whenever you see an angle in the kata, those two rules have been enacted. So if you're looking at the kata sequence and you don't fully understand what it is, first thing is the angle, because it tells you where you are relative to the enemy. The next thing we're going to look at is stance. So again, it's another big clue. So knowing where we are relative to the enemy, the next thing we look at is stance. Because the stance tells you how your weight needs to shift for that technique. So if you're in a, a Zen Kutsudachi, a front stance, then the weight is forwards and down. If you're in a back stance, then the weight is back. If you're in a horse stance, you've dropped your weight straight down. If you're in a cat stance, that normally represents a fast shift one way or the other. Where you've got you know, the leg dropping back onto one leg as you quickly move. Mabuni uh, re records that. But essentially all the stances, whichever ones you've got, you know, because there's lots of them, show you how to shift your weight. If your feet suddenly come together or close together in the kata, whatever the technique is, requires your body weight to go up. Right, so, so that gives you an idea of what's happening as well. So you've got the angle, which tells you where you are relative to the enemy, and then you've got the required weight shift there as well. Um, it's very important that we understand that in the kata, the, the, um, the stance is a freeze frame for us. The kata wants to make it very clear. This is where you need to be at this point. But as I often joke uh, in my own class and seminars, there's only two things not moving in a fight, unconscious people and people who are about to be unconscious. You, know, you need to keep moving. Fights are very mobile. You don't want to remain in one place. So the stance is a, a snapshot in time, if you like, a frozen moment. Uh, Funakoshi talks about how in his 20 precepts, beginners use stances, advanced students use natural postures. So the beginner doesn't know how to intuitively move their weight yet, so we get them to move into the stances. It's not the stance that's important, it's the shift into the stance where the work has been done, the use of the body weight. And those positions become more natural, more fluid uh, of the advanced uh, student. When they apply them, the stances are there, but not there. They hit them, but just move straight onto them. And in Nakasone's explanation of that precept, the lovely line where he says, karate has many stances, it also has none. Love that. Right? So the idea, if you freeze frame a movement, if you had a video and you just freeze frame at any point, you've got a stance. Right? But in application, they're continuous, uh, continuous motion. So the, the cutter is the, the, the map, not the territory type thing. It maps it out quite clearly for us. In the bunkai, we do hit the stances, but we don't uh, freeze on them. We move and uh, move through them. So that's the second big one to get, right? You've worked out the angle, so you know where the enemy is relative to you. And then you look at the stance and you know which way your body's shifting, which way the power's going. And that will give you, again, a really big clue as to what's going on. And the third and final one is arm positions. So the, the, uh, the position that your arms are in will obviously tell you what's happening. So you now know what angle you're at. You now know which weight you're shifting at. What could the arms in that position be doing? What, what are they, they doing there? And that's normally when it starts to click in, into place. One problem that people can have if they're relatively new to Bunkai, and if they come from a 3K background, then they've practiced a lot of kicking, striking, and blocking, but they haven't practiced a lot of uh, throwing, postural disruption, joint locking, uh, choking and strangling, gripping. Th these things are a big part of old school karate, but have largely been ignored by some sections of the, uh, the karate community. Uh, I, I think of a quote from Igami, one of Funakoshi's students in his book, where he said, throwing techniques were practiced in my day. I recommend we reconsider them. 
So in that generation from Funakoshi onwards, you know, as we know, Funakoshi recorded lots of throws and locks in his books. That side of things goes. Funakoshi talked about how karate has both hard and soft methods. Hard being the striking, soft being the grappling. And it says how the, uh, this gives the art a beautiful texture, which I would agree with. It, it, it does. <laughs> um, so the, the arm positions will give you the clue. So again, but if you don't know that stuff, you, you can't see it. But once you've got a knowledge of, you, you know, you understand how locks work, throws work, everything else, you start to see, oh, I see what's going on now. So, so they're the, the, the big three, right? You've got the, the, the stance. Sorry, the, uh, the angle is the first thing. Right, then you've got the stance. So the angle tells you the position you are relative to the enemy. The stance tells you how your body weight's shifting. And knowing those two things, what could those arms position be doing? And that's when it will normally click. Uh, one important thing to do when you're looking at Katra as well is look what came before that movement and what became af after that movement as well. Because sometimes that will be your confirmation. So you look at this particular movement, goes, what comes after it? And you may find, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I thought this was a takedown. And look at that. That next movement would flow on perfectly from a takedown. Or I, I thought this was a joint lock. And yet that strike would work perfectly from the position they end up in. It becomes a tick. It becomes a check when you look at the next movement. One thing you do need to be mindful of is that sometimes in the cat, the next movement shows you what to do if the preceding technique had failed. You know, so it's like a flow chart. Did it work? Did it not work? So, so uh, you can also look at that when you're looking at it. Okay, so this is the technique. I, th I think I've got that. Would the next movement flow on from here or would it flow on from the position I would be in if the technique failed? And if you get a tick there, that's a very good sign that you, you're, you're, you're wrong or something there. Uh, and one important thing I always say, you know, it's important to know when to get the scissors in. Uh, this is a, a phrase I picked up from... Uh, uh, in my early days when I started making uh, videos, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a woman who used to train television presenters. Uh, and we were asked by the production company, if you want to work with her, you can. It's free. We'll sort it all out. Some of the martial artists on their books didn't want to do it. I left at the chance, right? Because I want to improve what I do. And she was very helpful in looking at how I come across on camera and how that could be improved. Never watch TV the same way again after that, I tell you. You realise how skilled it is to look that natural. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but one of the things she kept telling me was, uh, Ian, when you finish talking about something, give us time to get the scissors in. That, that's what she kept saying, So, which I've done when recording this video. I've left pauses uh, when I'm talking, so therefore I can put the little graphics in that you've now already seen, right? So it's the same with the cat there. You need to know when to get the scissors in. It's worth remembering that the word bunkai, which throughout the karate world, even in Japan, we take to mean the applications of kata. But you've got two characters, which essentially means something like to chop into little bits and to understand. So I always say a good English equivalent might be something more along the lines of to dissect something. But there's an element of cutting there. So you don't hit the person with the entire kata. The kata is a collection of techniques. And you need to know when one method ends and the next method begins. Because sometimes it goes, right, that's one lesson. We're on to something else. And people get stuck on how do I connect those two? Well, they're not supposed to be connected. So the first thing you do is you see if they could be. And if you realize, well, you know, no, they're, they're definitely not. But I'm confident about what this first part is. Then you start again. This is a new lesson. This is something else in, in, in the second part. Which is another minor thing you need to be aware of is uh, the stitching of the kata. So these discrete combative drills and techniques and illustrations of principle are all obviously in the kata. They're all put end to end. So on occasions you get like foot movements, for example, which are just there to link the two movements together. The example that runs to mind uh, for those who practice the pinans or hian katas, if you think of uh, pinan nidan or hian shodan, after the adyuki or the jodanuki, the back foot goes round and does a gidambarai. Right? And then you do a punch, and then the front foot goes round and does a gidambarai. So people will, oh, what's the purpose of that back turn? It hasn't got a purpose. It's just getting it at the 90 degree angle that the movement needs to be applied at from the agyuki, which is an unrelated technique. If it was part of the technique, it would be the same on both sides. The back foot would be the one that moves. It's, it's not, it's, it's asymmetrical. So there's lots of these things, but they're the big three. They're the big three to start with, right? In this order. Angle first, because that tells you the angle that you are at in relation to the enemy. Next thing is stance, because the stance tells you how your weight is shifting. Knowing where you are relative to them, knowing which way your weight's shifting, what could the arms be doing from there? That will normally all click into place. You know, 
once you've got that, then again, you can check it by looking at what becomes before and after the, the, the movement with the caveats of what we've just talked about. If it all seems to click together, then you've got what is a solid application for that movement. Now, of course, opinions vary on what the correct application is. I think in some cases, we've got historical sources. In other cases, it's so obvious it couldn't be anything else. Some cases, there's like disagreements, right, you know, or, or alternative opinions, which I think is fine, right? The, the way I um, always check it, if you like, you know, or, or say whether a bit of bunkai is valid, is that it's got to be as the kata. You can't be adding in, you know, oh, oh yeah, we're adding a punch and a kick here, which you see quite commonly. It should be as the kata, accepting that there will be some variations in the nature of combat. Your arm might be slightly higher or lower, depending if they're taller or shorter, that kind of stuff. The second one is, uh, is it shouldn't be at variance with anything the old masters told us about kata. So we should account for the angle, which we've talked about. We should talk uh, about the stance, which we've talked about. These are things that are well documented. And then the, the final thing is that it has to work, it has to be functional. So if I've got friends who maybe have a slightly different take on a movement than me, um, sometimes those movements are just slight variations, in which case it's essentially the same thing. Other times it's a bit more different. But if their application uh, is like the cutter, it's not a variance with anything the old master said about the nature of cutter, and it works for all intents and purposes, we can say it's correct. What really matters is that in your dojo, you know what the application is for you, right? So when the students come to this movement, you go, this is the application we teach. And that collection of the applications hangs together as a coherent whole. Uh, then you've got it as a fighting system and it's, it's working for you and it's doing traditionally what it's supposed, uh, supposed to do. It doesn't really matter if the dojo down the road has a slightly different take on things. When I think of all the karateka that I regularly teach joint seminars with, they have slightly different opinions on certain motions according to me, but in, in principle and intent, it's almost pretty much the same stuff, which is a good sign uh, on the right lines. So I hope you found this uh, quick beginner's guide, if you like, uh, to dissecting uh, kata useful. And all I'd encourage you is just, you know, do it. Research the kata, you know, read the katas, try and understand the kata. And it's a very rewarding process when the pieces start to click into place and you get two or three and then, the, oh, I see how this kata works. I see the kind of things it shows. It all starts to cascade from there. And it's very satisfying to be practicing these things that you know, are hundreds of years old and then to be able to read them and to get that information and to make use of it, to make yourself a more efficient martial artist. You know, it's a form of communication with the generations that came before. It's a massively satisfying process. And I'm here to help, of course, but I think it's important that you also um, spend time analysing your own kata, trying to read the kata, encourage your students to do the same and learn to speak the language of kata.